Hello everyone and welcome to EduSurge Clinics. I am Dr. Gunjan Desai and we continue our series on inflammatory bowel disease with shifting our discussion now to the third pillar that is endoscopy and the differential diagnosis on endoscopy. Now we have already seen this slide many times. If you have not seen the previous video, I would suggest seeing them because we are going in a nice sequence. We are in phase one on the natural history of disease, that is detection and diagnosis of disease. And in this, we have covered clinical features and laboratory findings as well as imaging-based differential diagnosis. So now we are going into endoscopy in IBD. So some very basic points on endoscopy and then we will go into the differential diagnosis on endoscopy. So what is the role of endoscopy in inflammatory bowel disease where it can be used for diagnosis or to distinguish between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. It helps in ruling out differentials. Endoscopy also helps in monitoring okay, in phase 2 and 3 to identify the extent and severity of disease as well as to assess their response to treatment. So role of endoscopy is different in different phases. Phase 1, it helps in diagnosis. It helps in differential diagnosis. 2 and 3, it will help in monitoring the grade, extent and severity of disease. And it will help in assessment of response. Exacerbations can be documented as well as remissions can be documented with endoscopy. It will also help in identifying complications and as a surveillance tool for identifying malignancy in ulcerative colitis. There is therapeutic role of endoscopy as well, but that we will not be discussing in this video as our focus here is on phase one. Coming to endoscopic assessment, we all know colonoscopy with ileal intubation is the preferred endoscopic approach for ulcerative colitis. Flexible sigmoidoscopy is an option. In Crohn's disease, you may need upper GI endoscopy. Then options include capsule endoscopy or balloon enteroscopy for small bowel evaluation. Spiral endoscopy, not routinely done. These days, we do capsule endoscopy more commonly where there is no suspicion of obstruction. And for all other cases, we would do CT or MR endrography. And you also have endoscopic ultrasound. So now ulcerative colitis, the classic endoscopic feature is that the disease extends from rectum proximally with continuous and circumferential mucosal and submucosal inflammation. Remember this line, this is the classic description of ulcerative colitis that you will see on an endoscopy report. There is continuous circumferential mucosal and submucosal inflammation from rectum proximally. The colorectal mucosa is hyperemic and erythematous. There will be a sharp demarcation at the proximal limit. This is important and it is commonly asked. Uneven irregular mucosa which is granular and which bleeds on touch. Okay, So mucosa bleeds on touch. Sharp demarcation at the proximal limit. The normal mucosal vascular pattern is lost. Okay, this is important. And the ulcers are superficial, surrounded by inflamed mucosa. So in ulcerative colitis, the disease extends from rectum proximally. Sharp demarcation of the proximal limit. There can be irregular, uneven, fine or rough granular mucosa with bleeds on touch. The normal mucosal vascular pattern is loss due to edema and if ulcers are there, they are superficial. If there is stricture in UC, then that is not commonly seen because ulcerative colitis, mucosa, submucosa disease, strictures are less common and if there are strictures suggestive of malignancy or further evaluation, if there are polyps or pseudopolyps, you have to evaluate them to rule out adenomas. What are atypical findings? 40% of ulcerative colitis can have skip lesions, whereas 10% cases have rectal sparing. This is important to remember. 40% have skip lesions, so can mimic Crohn's disease. 10% have rectal sparing, so lead to diagnostic dilemmas. There can be isolated appendicial orifice inflammation. And backwards ileitis is usually due to incompetent ileocecal valve. Okay. 
even in cases with backwash ileitis, the inflammation is not as severe as Crohn's disease and it is not transmural. Okay, that is what helps you in differentiating between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So with that coming to features of Crohn's disease, you have skip lesions, you have longitudinal serpiginous ulcers and in Crohn's disease, you have transmural inflammation, which is most common in terminal ileum. Inflammation is on the mesenteric side and there can be ephthers ulcers which are seen in Crohn's disease. It is the coalescing ulcers which result in the classic cobblestone appearance that is characteristic of Crohn's disease. The involvement is always with skip lesions and patchy and it is deep in Crohn's. Cecal inflammation is less likely. Because there is transmural inflammation, Crohn's disease can have stricture in contrast to ulcerative colitis where the involvement is of mucosa and submucosa. If upper GI tract is involved, then you can have similar solitary or multiple ulcers or erosions in esophagus, ephthers ulcers in stomach or second part of duodenum. So that is regarding Crohn's disease. Now, when we talk of differentials for intestinal tuberculosis, the most common site is ileocecal junction. The ulcers can be small to large and shallow to deep. Remember that Crohn's disease has longitudinally placed ulcers, whereas TB has transversely oriented ulcers. This is a characteristic feature in terminal ileum. And involvement is more likely to be circumferential than serpiginous. So, differentiating between Crohn's and TB in small bowel, ulcers can be superficial. Most common site is ileocecal junction. Crohn's has longitudinal and serpiginous, whereas TB has transverse and circumferential. Scar strictures and pseudopolyps can be seen in TB. Petulous ileocecal valve is more common in TB. Now going to some other differentials from our list, in CNSU there are sharply demarcated proximal ileal ulcers which is known as an appearance like coiled spring because the oblique alignment of the ulcers produce spiral stenosis and this spiral stenosis in an endoscopy looks like a coiled spring. Okay, Gastroduodenal or colonic superficial ulcers are also common in CNSU. Remember, CNSU is more common in young females and present usually with anemia and growth retardation. This we saw in the previous video. Chronic multifocal ulcerating stenosing andropathy, CMUSC, is more common in males as the name suggests it has multifocal superficial ulcers, most commonly in terminal ileum. However, these ulcers will never progress to cobblestoning, additions, fistula or fissure formation and they will remain confined to mucosa and submucosa. So that is how you can differentiate CMUSE from Crohn's disease. Coming to aphthous ulcer of Bessage disease, remember that Bessage disease has the classic description of aphthous ulcer. We had seen it in the video on imaging that it is a deep colostered ulcer. So this ulcer is deep in the ileocecal area. There can be one to five round or oval white ulcers with red peripheral rim. Base is covered in exudates and the ulcer usually heals without scarring. It is a volcano type ulcer with no distal colonic or anorectal lesion. So that is intestinal basset disease and Ephthus ulcer. Remember, ephthus ulcer is not specific to Bessage disease. It can also be seen in other etiologies. Okay. For infective colitis, for the, based on different infections that can lead to colitis, the features can be different. The non-specific features in infective colitis include mucosal erosions, edema, punctate hemorrhages, and mucoid exudates. So small erosions, edema punctate hemorrhages, that is point-like hemorrhages and mucoid exudates suggest infective colitis, but these are very non-specific finding. Okay, For specific infections, enteric fever usually results in longitudinal ulcers in terminal ileum and right colon is very rarely involved. Coming to amoebic colitis, right colon is the most commonly involved site and flask-shaped ulcers are classical of amoebic colitis. 
Rectosigmoid is involved in 30% of cases. So remember all these are very commonly asked questions and very important to remember in your daily practice. Amoebic colitis, flash shaped ulcer, Yersinia colitis, octopus sucker shaped ulcer, which has mucosal elevation in ileocecal area. Yersinia can also present with mesenteric lymphadenopathy. Campylobacter colitis and Shigella colitis can affect the rectosigmoid area and there will be very uneven discrete lesions in the rectosigmoid mucosa. Coming to Shigella colitis, the patient has watery diarrhea stool with blood mucus and tenacious. Now coming to pseudomembranous colitis, they usually have yellowish white plaques. Like I had said earlier, in pseudomembranous colitis, if you are suspecting this diagnosis, distal colon and rectum are most commonly involved. Avoid bowel preparation in colonoscopy for these cases because bowel preparation can remove the pseudomembranes. Okay, so that is an important point to remember. Ischemic enteritis or colitis, like we discussed before, the watershed locations will have stricture. What are the watershed locations? In small bowel, it is jejunum. In large bowel, it is splenic flexure or rectosigmoid junction. The stricture can be concentric, short or long, and single or multiple. In acute cases, you can have edema, ulceration, hemorrhage. And severe cases can have pneumatosis, transmural necrosis, and gangrene. So that is a brief on the role of endoscopy in diagnosis and differential diagnosis of IBD. We have also seen some points of where endoscopy can help during management, but that we will study when we discuss those phases. So from this video, you have to understand the differential diagnosis. Remember the points that you need to see when this scope is performed and understand that with these three pillars discussed, the final pillar pathology will give you a diagnosis. So it is very less likely that after having a thorough understanding and assessment of your patient with all these points, you fail to achieve a diagnosis. Okay, so usually all these points in mind, you will get a diagnosis and we will see how Pathology helps you in achieving that diagnosis and then proceed to phase two. Thank you.